Welcome, everyone. Hello. So I'm Matt Fowler, and I'm the lead pastor here. And Pastor Joellen uh, Axtelm is uh, associate pastor for Youth and Carry Ministries. And Pastor Jane Gibbs is a uh, ministry intern here and uh, United Campus Ministry pastor uh, here at UNK. So if you have questions about any of those ministries, do uh, memorize the backs of their heads so that you can know who to talk to. But my job is just to welcome you, uh, so I'm glad you're here, and we're glad to be able to be host, and I do thank my staff and the volunteers and uh, church folk who have made uh, welcoming uh, something that is enjoyable. I would say that after this worship service or boring church meeting, regardless, uh, we are ho serving coffee and water and cookies in the fellowship hall, which is directly back that way. And please, please, please go and have cookies and talk to one another. Because one, that's where all the ministry gets done. And two, I do not have the willpower for you to not eat all the cookies and to leave them instead with me. I am also supposed to tell you that should you need a restroom, there is one through the fellowship hall, and there are two this way around the, to the south, and another two back to the north. So if you want to be gone longer from the worship service or meeting, go to the north. Otherwise, go this way, right? Uh, but I'm really glad that we all can be together. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really delightful about our denomination and our church is the way that we get to share with one another in ministry and the way that Ron is leading us to share together in this becomes a way that we can uh, collaborate and learn from one another. The ways that God is working in your places of ministry become uh, gifts for all of us and inspirations for all of us. Uh, and it's uh, a big version of a class meeting where we get to celebrate what God is doing together. So thank you for being here. And Ron, thanks for letting us host. Thank you, Matt. Give us some uh, instructions. Matt was saying that this is also a time for us to share some of the celebrations and things of ministry that we'll be doing, and uh, that will, in fact, be something that we do. Um, I'm going to ask a very uncomfortable thing when we get to that point. I'm going to ask that you might stand up and mix around a bit. Um, uh, this is the fourth of these uh, regional church conferences that I've done across the uh, district, the, the western half of Nebraska. And um, my first one, I, I found much to my chagrin uh, that everybody stayed in their church and they just simply talked to one another about what wonderful things they were doing. And there wasn't a lot of sharing about what those wonderful things with the other uh, folks in the room. And uh, so when we get to that particular point, um, blame me for, for being such a, a hard taskmaster and making you get up and mingle around and mix it up a little bit. Um, let me have a word of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come into this place of celebration, of remembrance, of vision, of joy. Help us to remember who we are and whose we are and the connections of love and grace that we share as the people called United Methodist, the disciples of Jesus Christ, in this portion of this wonderful state of Nebraska. Amen. Well, let us uh, sing together, O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
seated. Oh, how I wish I paid attention. Um, as a local pastor, I attended many church conferences, charge tr- conferences, and for the life of me, I can't recall exactly what the district attendant was doing at any of those other than uh, going through those minutes and, and all that important business stuff. Um, I wish I'd paid more attention. Um, what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon with us as a, as a charge conference together of individual uh, congregations and in this um, portion of the Western Nebraska district, district is um, have an opportunity to hear about different uh, ministries uh, that are um, ongoing and work in, in this district and in the conference that we might avail ourselves as uh, local congregations. And so I've invited uh, several different uh, conference sorts of connections to share with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, one of those is uh, the Reverend uh, Jeff Klinger, who is uh, the Director of Congregational Excellence, and uh, he was not able to be here. Um, that's been the case in, in some of the other uh, gatherings that I've had. I've had different people that were, couldn't be here, but they had videos, and so today I've got um, one of those videos I don't have to show because I have a live person here, and, uh, but Jeff Klinger is going to be with us via the uh, um, the the video that we're going to show from Congregational um, Excellence from the conference. And there are some programs that are a part of that that you might be of interest to. Um, Pay attention, especially when he um, brings up the uh, What's Next uh, study that uh, is is available. That might be of interest to some of uh, you as congregations as you think about what is it that we're called to do next uh, in our ministries and in the proclamation of, of the good news of Jesus Christ. So you can watch that video now. Oh, I got way ahead of myself, but that's all right. Well, have you got that ready? If you have it ready, otherwise I will backpedal and I'll do what I was supposed to do, but. Okay. I'm very thankful for tech people. (laughs) Great Plains Annual Conference. My name is Jeff Klinger. I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Congregational Excellence and Connectional Ministries. And it's a great joy to bring you brief greetings this fall in the midst of this busy administrative season in the life of our churches. I know charge conferences are happening and district conferences are happening in different formats all across our new 10 districts. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to just uh, be here with you virtually and to make a brief uh, introduction to a few things and really just spend a couple of minutes with uh, an invitation for you to be considering a resource that we put together as a team this last year and that we're really excited about and hopeful for. But thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention to these few moments today. Thank you for being present. uh, And thank you for all of the ways that you serve Christ and the church through your leadership. I'm going to take just a moment and share my screen so that you can see some slides that will walk us through this conversation here. Um, Again, I am the Director of Congregational Excellence. It's a real privilege to serve in this role. You might know uh, some of these names through various uh, conference work, but not realize that they are all a part of the Congregational Excellence team. I know before I started serving in this role, and when I was a local church pastor, I didn't always know what department different folks were in, in terms of conference staff. So uh, you might know Nicole Connard through work with Campus Ministry and District Strategies over the years, our Associate Director, Reverend Dr. Richard Fitzgerald serving as the Conference Circuit Pastor currently, uh, Melissa Gepford doing Intergenerational Discipleship, Ed Hoffman's our Administrative Assistant, Jeannie Leeper is our Day Leadership Coordinator, Reverend Dr. Gerald Liu, our Emerging Faith Communities Cultivator, Sarah Marsh, our Justice and Mercy Coordinator, and Reverend Holly Tapley, our disaster response coordinator. Each of these persons, though they work in areas of specialization, uh, also are a part of the team that seeks to uh, help congregations grow uh, in their health and in their vitality. And so it's our privilege to serve alongside of you uh, in this shared work. Again, as I said today, just a couple of quick uh, save the dates and then one deeper invitation The first of those save the dates is some local church lay leadership trainings 
Uh, we're going to be holding these in January. Uh, it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, um, each evening from 7 to 8.30 Central Time. We're still finalizing the details around which gathering will be on which evening, uh, but over the course of those three nights, we will do trainings for trustees, chairpersons, finance chairpersons, staff parish chairpersons, uh, administrative boards, the one board, uh, the nominations team, and lay leaders. Uh, so I hope you'll make a note of those dates and look for more details to come in the next weeks. The other save the date is for the spring uh, Laity Summit happening February 23rd uh, of 2025. That's a Sunday afternoon again this year with the hope that you might do watch parties in your churches. Uh, that'll go from 1.30 to 5 o'clock Central. That gives space for uh, congregations in the mountain time zone to finish worship and get set up uh, with a little bit of lunch for their watch parties. The deeper invitation that I want to extend today, though, is a, an invitation to consider using a resource that our team put together this last year, uh, calling it the What's Next Discernment Guide. Uh, it's divided into five sessions. I'll briefly overview those in a minute. Uh, you can scan this QR code and it'll get you a link to the guide. Um, I'm also happy my email address is at the end of this uh, presentation. I'll be happy to get you a copy of it if you're interested in seeing it. Uh, and for some reason, the QR code is not working for you. Uh, this guide works on a couple of assumptions. Uh, the first underlying assumption is that God is calling all churches to help people grow in their love of God and neighbor and self. Again, we have used the language of congregational excellence as an annual conference, uh, but whether it's health or vitality, the idea is that God is calling all of us as communities of faith to help people who are already connected and not yet connected grow in love of God, neighbor, and self. If you were a part of filling out charge conference paperwork for your congregation this year, um, we have framed that around the Great Commandment and the Great Commission uh, with the invitation for you to think about some intentional things that you would do uh, to help people grow in their love of God with heart, soul, mind, strength, and their love of neighbors as themselves, which means growing in love of self as well. And in addition to the Great Commandment, the Great Commission then is this idea of growing as uh, disciples to make other disciples, baptizing, teaching remembering that the risen Christ is with us always. So with those two uh, things, the great commandment and the great commission as our foundation and the great plans, uh, we put together this five session discernment guide, calling it the what's next guide, with the sense that there is some next step that God is calling your congregation to. The first session gives you an opportunity to look back at the timeline of your congregation, uh, recollecting how God has been faithful in the past, the second session is reflecting on who you are now and your current realities as 2024 prepares to turn into 2025. The third session is uh, looking out the window, if you will, realizing who your neighbors are now and thinking about the people that God has placed you in the midst of. The fourth session is an opportunity to begin dreaming about how God might be calling you as a congregation to share God's love with your neighbors. And then the fifth session is a chance to really discern together what are those couple of next steps that God might be calling you to take. Again, we have the sense that this is best undertaken as a joint effort uh, with a lay leader and the pastor of your local church. Uh, it's not something that one does to the other, but really a joint effort to be undertaken. So I hope you'll scan that QR code if you haven't already. Um, but you'll take an opportunity to explore that in the coming year. And again, please never hesitate to reach out. One of my great joys is to process and to workshop and to talk through things with local church leaders who are trying to figure out how they can lead uh, the congregation into that most faithful next step that God is calling them to. So happy to receive emails, phone calls, text messages, um, and to resource and support you in whatever way I can. Uh, again, it's a great privileged to be serving uh, in this role at this time. So thank you again for the time today. Uh, thank you for your leadership to Christ and the church. God bless you. All right.
some uh, great resources to avail yourself uh, as, as local congregations there as well. Um, Jeff and the uh, rest of the Congregational Excellent team often in consultation with me on uh, different ministries that are uh, emerging in this particular district, and so uh, it was a, it's a great thing to hear about uh, some of those opportunities as well. Um, give an update about our district council and district connecting council. Um, part of the restructuring that we did at uh, annual conference uh, early in May, or June, I guess it was, beginning of June, um, we consolidated some of the districts. Kansas saw the most changes with boundaries on where the district lines were. Uh, this particular district, Gateway and the Great West, we just sort of rubbed the line apart between the two and, and we became one big happy family. Um, there were a couple churches that had to be shuffled up towards the uh, northeast corner of, uh, of the district, but other than that, um, you here today are pretty much uh, the gateway group uh, of the district, and um, the, the, the Great West uh, was uh, merged in with us. We are now a total of 69 United Methodist churches in the western half of Nebraska. We are the largest uh, geographical district in the conference, and so uh, that leads to all sorts of interesting uh, comparisons when I go to cabinet meetings and people ask, how many miles have you driven? And uh, it's just uh, Zach Anderson, who's the uh, Western Kansas uh, District Superintendent, he and I have a sort of an ongoing competition as to what that might look like. But uh, another part of the uh, reorganization of the districts is we're moving um, to a one board model, if you will, for the district. And uh, we're going to be beginning uh, all across the conference. Well, each district will have a district connecting council that will be composed of an equal um, number of lay persons and clergy um, members that will be on that uh, particular connecting council. Uh, they'll be taking over the uh, building and uh, strategy committee, uh, the uh, district superintendency committee, and uh, I can't remember, there's another one on there. But anyway, they're going to be doing all, all, all three, oh, strategy committee, and they'll be doing all of those things uh, together collectively. Um, but once a year, we are called um, together to be a district council, and everyone that's a member of the annual conference session, uh, lay and clergy, are a member of this district council. Well, uh, we were under a mandate by the, uh, I guess, the Book of Discipline um, to form this district council by um, the end of the year, um, 2024. And uh, as, I, as I looked at our district, it's really hard to do such a thing in person. Um, future plan is that at annual conference, we'll meet together as the Nebraska annual conference practice was, that we meet together as a district for breakfast and we'll do those uh, district councils at, the, at that particular time. This year we couldn't do that, we're gonna have to do it by a Zoom, which will be a lot of fun with uh, 69 churches and 69 uh, lay folk and 69 clergy, you see it, it gets pretty uh, uh, major. Um, the main function of this district council this year at this particular time, which will be next Saturday at um, 10 a.m., which is 9 Mountain Time, I have to remember those folks that are way out there. Um, we'll be meeting on Zoom and we'll be simply dealing with two agenda items. One is uh, approving the slate of people that will serve on the District Connecting Council that have been asked and who have volunteered to be on that uh, for the next um, until annual conference time. And the other is that we're approving um, the budget for the district. You had district mission shares, and this year some of you have been looking at uh, the, the uh, mission share offering letter that you received and you saw there are no district mission shares. Well, what they're doing is they're giving back to each of the districts 5% of the money that's collected in the district. So if you paid your apportionment, your mission share, 100%, we'd get 5% of that money back to, to do all the funding of, of district mission projects that we're already doing. Um, knowing that's not always the case, and especially in these particular times, we will receive a little bit less than that um, as, we, uh, as we move into this new budgeting year. 
but we're uh, trying to figure out how to uh, continue to do the mission work that we have already committed to um, in, the, uh, in this particular district. Um, it's a new experience for the people down in Kansas. They didn't have any mission money to work with on it as a district, and so they're excited about that. Um, our budget really doesn't change that much for what your district uh, share was providing to the district before, um, but you're going to see that money come out of your uh, um, the conference apportionment or mission share instead of being asked uh, as a separate offering from the district. So in theory, that means you should be paying less mission share total dollars. Yay! Okay, there you go. There's the good news. All right. So that is going to be happening. The Zoom meeting for the district council will be next Saturday, 10 o'clock. Um, if you have not, if you're in this room and you haven't received a, a letter of invite to that, make sure that uh, Christy Baltzel, who is the, my administrative assistant who is at the desk back there, make sure she's aware of that and we can make sure that uh, you get an invite to that, to that Zoom session. It really should be very short. If you show up, I'm hoping, 15 minutes late, we'll all be gone and everything will be voted and, and taken care of, but we'll, we'll see how that works. When you bring over 100 people together, who knows what's going to happen, technology and everything. So, Vindith Vargas, if you would share a little bit about uh, an offering that's happening a little closer here, at least you're a, a resource person that's closer to uh, our locality here. I think that one works. Hello, faithful. Uh, it is lovely to see you in a time as this. Last year, I was sharing with you about a wonderful experience with the youth conference in Florida. Now, what I bring to share with you is as part of the Mercy and Justice Committee that you saw is led by Reverend Sarah Marshall and, and several of us clergy and laity, we had a justice encounter in Oklahoma. Why did we go to Oklahoma? Because there is so much to learn. So much that has happened that probably is not always seen or we try then not to look at. We did go to the center. We began in Oklahoma City. Then we went towards the west and ended up on the east part in Tulsa. So you will turn a little bit then with me uh, all together in what we did. As we see, well, we're, we have, uh, Oklahoma does have a panhandle as well. Could we please? Thank you. And, and yeah, we did just by where Oklahoma says. So being blessed with a Bishop uh, Wilson and myself being blessed serving the congregations of Overton, Elm Creek, and Williamsburg, that they allow that as part of my ministry I could go in these journeys and, and serve and learn and share about it. So our first stop, it was at a church in Oklahoma, where we see that that church, they, were, they, were, they found a way to renew themselves because of the building because of attendance. So they joined an effort with another one and they hosted, they received us in a building that had joined congregations. From there then we took, we started heading west and we went to the Washita site. If you like history, if you have read or seen, it is known as the battle, battle site. It's a battlefield. History tells us the truth, and it was a massacre site. It hurts to read about it, to hear about it, and to be there. You see all those tables that are at the bottom, at the top, that plague? Those are offerings in memories of all those lives that were lost in that event. Visiting with the ranger as it was there, he was saying that in order to be part, marked as a national historical site, it has to be marked as a battlefield, not as a massacre site. Because where the funds come from, because to be 
part of it. But we know how circumstances were. But that was the past, and we live in the present, and we want to do things different. So to be informed is the best that we can do. Once that we got there, we walk that path. And we heard about, do you see? It looks like there is nothing. The trees that you see at the, at the end of that picture, at the horizon, that's where the creek was. That was the rescue site, the protection for those who were living there. The hills that you can see and not see at the back, that horizon, that's where the armed forces were guarding and observing. When was the best time to surround them and attack? There were no men. There were mostly women, elder, and children. They were all around and used all their weapons. When you read what happened, when you heard the narrative, the creek was frozen at the time. And the people, they were describing how their legs were hurting as the ice was breaking and cutting when they were running trying to save their dear ones. Armless against weapons. We walked that path on a day that was, the temperature was lower than it, it was expected, but that gave us just an idea of how it was to stand there. Flowers are not part of an offering, but you will see that there was a ribbon in her, my hand there. That's the one that you take and you pray. And that's what we did as a group. After you pray, you go and you tie that on the trees. That is how they honor the ones that are no longer. And that's what we could do being there at that moment. History says that Black Kittle, the same gentleman, the chief then of the group, he had been at the Sand Creek. You heard about that one, Colorado, something similar happening, another massacre. He was there with his family. He was one of them, if you see. Black Kittle was acting chief at Washita and had survived the massacre at Sand Creek Reservation. The date is not far from today, November 29, 1864. Where 163 Cheyenne were killed, mostly women and children. What he did when, the, when he saw the attack coming, he did as he had been instructed by authorities. The flag of the country and a white flag waving them. So they will see that they were not going to resist anything of what was happening. But yet, they were attacked. 163 lives were taken. Black Kittle and his wife, they survived and they were asked to be moved once again and to go to Oklahoma, to be there at Washita site where the same story repeated. Those are the things that we have to see, that we have to read, that we have to share in having the first Native American bishop, not just in our conference, but in the denomination. It gives us an opportunity to learn even more to listen to him is inspiring, the stories that he can share with us. So when we see the next slide, please. Thank you. Just as a comment, General William Shelby Harney, a member of the Indian Peace Commission, he stated, I have worn the uniform of my country 55 years, and I know that Black Kittle was a good a friend of the United States as I am. But we know that that was yesterday. And, and, and what happened there is not to be forgotten, is not to be ignored, that it happens, but it's for us who live now to see what we do and how can we do. Diaz, he mentioned mission shares. And some of the agencies that benefit from those mission shares 
or Native American ministries. The Native American ministries, they do with those, there is scholarships. So students can be educated and we have pastors from those nations. So that's how important it is and how connected we are. And from our pews where we're sitting, we say, well, what can I do to change? There is change and there are things that we can do for that. And there is always good. I can show you the next one then because we're Methodists. So what do we do when we gather? Yes, we do. So look at that. <laughs> so there was some fried bread happening, of course. And what you see there, uh, the ladies that are, that are next to me, uh, yeah. One of them, lay leader, as you are, and we're so thankful for you saying yes to that role. The other one is a pastor. And what they were sharing with us is that this church, the church that they have on that side of the state, started a program, an after-school program. And with that, since the time that she started that program, they have warranted the 100% of the students attending to that program to graduate from high school and enroll in higher education. That is what happens with what we do and the connectivity, the connectionalism, and what we can do together. And I mentioned that we have the first Native American uh, bishop but not just that, because I don't know if you know then, do you have any other bishop who knows how to fix then some fried bread? Because, well, I was helping them serving. He, he, the, the bread that I had, it was bishop who fried that one. So, <laughs> and it's good, and it's all to share. But there is always the sun that is shining for all. So there is another ministry, another agency that we visited, and that is a garden, a skyline. So for that one, also good because it began as a community garden and now it has over a mile then of produce. And the building that you see, there is, there is a food pantry, but not like the food pantry that we most may know because when you walk in it, those visitors, they get a cart, like a grocery store style. And there are aisles and they choose what they need. But not just that, if there are some physical needs, there is a clinic and they had a doctor and they have an optometrist and they have a variety of lenses that they could choose what they need and go with that need covered. And things like that, they're not just stop there. There is a place where they can get, they choose the attire that they need if there is either a school visit or a job interview. So they are ready for success, and that is good. So after then being there in Oklahoma, we did, and if you have an opportunity to visit, there is the First Nations Museum. It's an excellent place to visit, it's history. And I could tell you so much about it, but there is no time. <laughs> but I love it because the congregation, they know then how I love museums and love art and how to know about others. So that part is great. Encounters this, they do not stop there. We visited Greenwood, we went to Tulsa, and there are more to come. So if it's in your heart and interest to do this, last year I shared about the youth, and you know the age limit that we had. But these encounters are for all of us. So if you're interested, just let me know about it, and I'll be more than glad to share with you when the next one is happening so you can be part of it and invite those from your congregation. Thank you for you. Well, as Pastor Vindith was uh, sharing with us, uh, we have opportunities in sharing in those uh, particular ministries through our mission shares, but also in those opportunities, um, maybe contacting you if we have a local church or maybe a local interest and in, uh, being part of the, one of those justice encounters, um, we can uh, sure steer you in the right direction. Uh, let's see, I have a mission opportunity as well from um, the United Women of Faith. Let me grab one of these so I can read from it as we, uh, I'm going to need some help maybe to distribute that. And let me just take off one of these. Thank you. Let 
And this also has a connection. Uh, Pastor Vendith Varga is on uh, the mission education tour director. Um, so this is an opportunity that's coming up this next year. This is especially tailored for our young women, ages uh, 15 to 20. It's a hands-on mission experience, and they'll be touring United Methodist Mission sites. There's more details that will come out about the particular dates, which are in June, and the locations. They're still sort of in the planning stages of all that. And um, that uh, just information, if you have uh, some young women in your congregation, or maybe a grandkid, granddaughter, that uh, might be interested in, in doing this, uh, just a, a wonderful opportunity, a four-day uh, mission trip um, coming up this next year. So you might just take back that information to uh, your local church and especially to uh, your, our United Women in Faith. They have, they have my phone and the phone for both of them? Okay. And the other person is uh, Mary Ellen Kilmer is also part of that uh, mix of folks as well. So um, she's our deacon uh, over in the Scotts Bluff area. And uh, so we'll mention that as an opportunity of, of mission with Mercy and Justice Ministries. Jim Cedarberg, I invite you to come and share about our district lay servant ministry. Good afternoon. I might as well deal with one question I get frequently right up front, and I was visiting with uh, one of your pastors a few minutes ago, and when I told him I was the district lay servant director, he asked if I ever provide pulpit supply, and I said, yes, I do. And then he asked where I'm from, and I could see the wheels turning because I live in Kimball, and he says, where is that? Well, it's... <clears throat> it's right on I-80, just 20 miles from Wyoming. But I told him distance is not a problem. I have some really great friends. My freshman uh, roommate lives just outside of Holdridge. I have really good friends halfway between Shelton and Ravenna. I have family in Grand Island, and I have six grandkids in Lincoln, so a trip to your community might accidentally go through Lincoln as well. So. Coming out here is an opportunity the way I look at it. So I talked to a family before I left Kimball this morning and asked if I could talk about them just a little bit, and they said that would be fine. You see, every third Sunday of the month, we are blessed with the bell choir, which we absolutely enjoy. And just as they were starting this morning, starting the intro, we had an escapee. We had a little two-year-old with tears in his eyes heading down the aisle just as fast as he could go. And he made it about 15 feet before daddy saw him. And so you can guess who won the race. But the reason he was doing that is there's grandma and grandpa and mommy all in that bell choir. And I had to think there are so many ways that those youngsters add delight to our lives. And then I happen to think later, you know, I'll bet he also adds delight for God in the way he was expressing his love for family. And what do we do that delights God? And we do so many things, don't we? Lay people are key to our church. If we left everything up to the pastor, the church wouldn't survive, would it? But if a church without a pastor is also somewhat adrift, it's that partnership that makes it work. And so from my perspective, it's my goal to provide as many opportunities as possible to better equip our lay people to serve. Now, just envision in a perfect world where all of the lay people are absolutely perfectly equipped to serve. What could the church do? It could do so much. And yet, we don't live in a perfect world, but as Methodists, we are asked to strive for perfection. 
in the only way we get to strive toward perfection is through service, through prayer, through Bible study, and education. And it's the lay ministry courses that help fulfill that education part. It helps us better employ those gifts that God gives us in service to others, and by serving others, we serve God. It is by no coincidence that those of us who are intimately involved in the church are the ones whose faith is growing the most rapidly. But I'm going to challenge each and every one of you to stay on a path of intentional faith development. Now, there's a multitude of lay servant courses that can help keep us on that path of intentional faith development. Someone may have one special interest and the God-given gifts that fits that, and if they find a course that fits that special interest, and that's all they take so they can better serve in that area, that's fine. Some people want a little broader approach, and so they strive to become a certified lay servant. In order to do that, you complete the basic lay course, you complete a course on God's given gifts, you become certified through safe gatherings, and you file an annual report showing what you have done. Four steps to become certified lay servant. The other thing is for renewal, you need to show that you have taken one of the approved advanced courses within the past three years. Some of us feel called to move forward just a little farther. And so from there, you can go for a certified lay speaker, certified lay minister, or some people do both. Personally, I chose to become a certified lay speaker. In order to do that, there's five more courses to take. And they were designed intentionally to be a well-rounded set of courses to help us grow individually. A course on living our United Methodist beliefs. And for me, I found that interesting because until a few years ago, I was a Lutheran, had been all my life. And I really enjoyed not only the history of the church, but really getting to fully understand the basic tenets of the Methodist Church and how we can live with those tenets. And I will tell you personally, I'm more comfortable theologically as a Methodist than I was as a Lutheran. So it's a good fit for me. Four more courses. There's one on the polity, the, the whole structure of the Methodist Church and all the different missions that the Methodist Church had. And we just had an an example of one of those, but the church does so much locally, district-wide, worldwide, so much that the church does, and I, I still don't have my arms wrapped around all of that. A course on leading and planning worship. A course on preaching, and I'm missing one. Oh, leading and planning, leading and planning, okay. Whatever. Anyway, personally, it'll come to me about 2.30 a.m. Personally, I've found that every time I took one of those courses and looked back, I had to admit my faith was stronger. Every time I completed a course, my appreciation for the church was higher. With every course, I was more and more proud to be UMC. And with each and every one of those courses, my desire to serve God was more intense. And so it's through that experience and my personal experience that I have a desire to share that and, and watch other people see that personal growth and that enthusiasm for the church. 
Ultimately, the better equipped our laity is, the stronger our church is. And so we all work on that together. Now, if we become certified lay servant, certified lay speaker, certified lay minister, the question is, what do we do with that? And realistically, that depends on you. And I'm going to give two rather unique il uh, incidents to illustrate that point. When I was taking, and I don't remember which of the courses it was, or taking it online through Be a Disciple, there's 15, or 13 people that are allowed in a course. And I'm guessing typically there's eight or 10 that actually complete the course. But every day you turn in an assignment for everybody to read and typically you're required to respond at least to, to at least two of those from other classmates, be it criticism, agreement, sharing personal experience or whatever. The last day of the class, one of them said that was the last course he needed to take to become a certified lay speaker and he's moving forward toward certified lay minister. And I thought, well, you know, I've seen enough of this person that he could lead a congregation very well. He has a way of dealing with people. But that thought was soon dispelled because he explained that he works in a mental health facility. And he said every class he took, he grew personally, but with every class he was taking tools to put into his toolbox and he's using those tools to insert Christianity into his mental health counseling. He had no desire to be giving sermons in a church or serving a congregation, but he was building his own abilities to insert Christianity and present it to others. The other one I found very interesting, I took the basic course through Zoom. It was the good old COVID days. There were two districts in eastern Nebraska who offered the course. At the end of each of those six hour and a half sessions, they had a special guest. And it might be a certified lay speaker, one was the district lay servant director, uh, certified lay ministers and so forth. But the one that really struck me was a lady that I'm guessing is in her 80s. And you could just see the sparkle in her lie and those, in her eyes and the smile on her face that she really enjoyed life. But she explained that she took four of the five work days each week. Two of those days she would go and visit nursing home residents. The other two she would visit prisoners. And I'm thinking, no way would I do that. And then she says, now I want you to know I'm a certified lay speaker, but don't ever ask me to give a sermon. And I thought, thank God for giving each and every one of us our own set of special God-given gifts so that we as a group together combine our gifts to make a stronger and a stronger church. So what I'm asking is let's work together you have your special needs and desires. Everybody's a little different. I've worked with one church. I was kind of heading one way and they were kind of resisting. And so we have a good plan of action now where actually instead of one class that we're going to be presenting there in their church, we'll be presenting two different ones at the same time, but it better fits their needs. So we can work together and please let's work together and build our church to be even stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And Christine Roberts is here in person to uh, share with us a little bit of the, the work and the offerings of the uh, Nebraska United Methodist Foundation. Yeah. Lucky you guys, the other three charge conferences got the video. Um, but my brother lives here in Kearney, so you get me. So I'm Christine Roberts. I'm the director at Nebraska United Methodist Foundation. I'm 
born and raised United Methodist. Um, I am a member currently at Wahoo First United Methodist Church, and my brother is a member here at Kearney First. Uh, we grew up in the Valley United Methodist Church, which is closed now. And so it has become my passion working at Nebraska United Methodist Foundation to make sure no other churches close if they can help it. And so that's the mission of the foundation is to help each individual church with investment services, education, and grants and scholarships. Uh, so first I want to describe um, with urgency uh, what you may or may not know about right now is this great generational transfer of wealth. And that is urgent right now because the baby boomers are passing down their wealth from their generation to the next one. And Jim, that's where that two-year-old pops into my head. Is Kimball First United Methodist Church going to be there for that two-year-old and that two-year-old's family someday? And that's where the transfer of wealth and creating endowments are so very important right now. Your usual Sunday morning offerings are not going to cut it anymore. I'm, I'm telling you, you know this, right? Your Sunday morning offerings are not going to cut it anymore. You have to do something different. And the foundation exists as a resource, a free resource, for you to use for us to come educate your congregation on how they can remember your local church and their estate planning, and we can also give seminars and workshops on blended gifts, giving to your annual operating budget now, but remembering the church in your estate plan. Jack, right? That's what I'm saying. So use us as a resource. Uh, we were here a month ago at Kearney First for Central slash Western. This, is, this isn't Western, we're still in the middle here. Uh, Nebraska on... <laughs> Well, that's me, that's me. Uh, for, uh, we did a put your house in order event, uh, and I did record all of those uh, presenters, and they are on our YouTube channel if you want to take some time to review what those speakers presented on. Uh, they were just 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, if you wanna just pop one up during a church service or you want your finance committee to see one, I know, not during church service, I know, um, especially with the holidays. But they're there as a resource. Uh, and then I also want to highlight the foundation's grants and scholarships. Uh, Jim, again, looking at you. We have reimbursement grant monies for lay servant ministries at the foundation in addition to what the conference provides. Our application is up on our website as well. So if you are interested in becoming a lay servant, we have funds to help you out. And then uh, beginning January 1st, we have grants for new church plants. Uh, if you know community members that may have been affected by disaffiliations and they wanna start a new United Methodist Church, well, we have funds for you. And then we are also now offering our ministry grants twice a year. And so that used to be traditionally a fall program that we just wrapped up here in October. But January 1st, we are open again for a spring session. So if your church has a ministry that it is passionate about and would need some funds, please submit an application. Those would be due by March 31st. And then we hand out funds at our board meeting in April. Okay, uh, there's so much more. There's so much more. Um, come, I'm standing back there across where you got your stuff from Christy. Come see me. Uh, we can set up a time for me or our director of stewardship, Sharon, to come to your church. You can take some literature to your church with you. We have plenty, and if we don't have plenty and run out, we can mail you some. And then again, I'm also we have these awesome brochures on legacy societies, which ties into the transfer of wealth that I would love to educate your committees or congregations on. Uh, so come see me. Thank you. Well, there's some wonderful opportunities with the Nebraska United Methodist Foundation. Um, to be clear, they are not in competition with what we're doing as far as fundraising and things in our local churches. Uh, they are a partner with what we do. 
And um, also, I would affirm that you not stop taking up your Sunday offering, because that's probably an important part of the money's coming in, but uh, to recognize that there are some other opportunities and ways that we can do um, raising of those funds and uh, monies to, to help fund what we are doing in our ministries locally. So I, I'd lift that up as a, a wonderful opportunity for us. And I share with you... scripture from Ephesians that I've been reflecting on over this uh, course of these charge conferences that we uh, that I've been a part of um, over the last uh, couple of months. This is from Paul's letter um, to the Ephesians to the church of Ephesus uh, first chapter verses 15 to 21. Um, Hear these words as Paul writes Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, this is the reason that I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers, and what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers. This power is conferred by the energy of God's powerful strength. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at the right, God's right side in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now, but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head over everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. Amen. When you join a local United Methodist Church, you made a vow, a promise. Um, It's been refined, it's been formalized over the years. When I was a young person joining the Wayside United Methodist Church in Lomita, California, um, I made the vow back in 1979 to uphold and be loyal to the United Methodist Church, um, those ministries by my prayers, my presence, my gifts, and my service. A few years ago, in 2008, um, we as the United Methodist Church added the word witness to those vows, to that promise. And um, you might be able to repeat that question with me in your mind if, as, as I read these words of that, of that promise. As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And we answered, I will. It is a vow, a promise most likely recalled during the church year in confirmation service when we have uh, younger folks coming forward and when he asks them uh, that, that, uh, that particular vow in their response. It's a vow that gets repeated as uh, new members join our congregations, a vow that is repeated as we reaffirm and renew our commitment to, to be a part of the church as we recommit ourselves to that promise, that vow. I have been thinking a lot about that, uh, that particular vow that I took many years ago, that uh, vow, that promise that we share collectively as United Methodists, and especially upon that addition that was made in 2008 of being a witness. What is our witness as individuals? What is our witness as a church? We have been through some rough times.
times. We continue to be in some rough times. Challenging circumstances that have confronted us over the last many years. We still find ourselves in menacing waters. You know them. Those waters that have crashed hard against us and continue to buffet and swirl around us. Issues that are ones that challenge our understanding of grace and justice and who we are as God's people. In the local church, we've often felt the impact of those particular waters in our membership numbers. We look around and see maybe a few more empty pews and folks that are no longer a part of our fellowship, of our congregation. We feel the impact of, uh, of those waters uh, on financial numbers, bottom lines. But the impact is much deeper than just numbers on a page or in a pew. What is our witness in such times as this? Grief and mourning, anguish, anger, fear, paralysis. Many Sundays ago, I was up at uh, Menden, uh, the United Methodist Church there, and uh, Pastor Peter was uh, sharing a, a children's sermon. And uh, Pastor asked a, a, a very disturbing question of the children. Do you remember that, Peter? You asked them the question that, that just stirs us and disturbs us, I, I suppose might be a better way of saying that, is how many days until Christmas? <laughs> oh, yes. That familiar litany of the response, of, of a chuckle. It's a nervous chuckle, though. We're almost sort of uh, feeling, ah. Uh. At that particular time you asked that question, Peter, it wasn't even Halloween and, uh, or Thanksgiving. And uh, what, what should a pastor be messing with people by asking such a question? But the kids weren't hostile to the question at all. They, uh, for the most part, kind of shrugged their shoulders a bit. They, they came up with some very creative answers um, one girl, I think she is in your family, uh, said 55 had to be the correct answer. And uh, at that point, uh, Pastor Peter said, well, there were, that was, really wasn't his point of, of asking uh, that question. Uh, but it had to be over 60, uh, Peter thought. Um, by the way, it was 73 days at that particular Sunday. If you're counting today, it's 38 Ooh. The point of the children's sermon, though, was a question deeper than counting on our fingers how many days till Christmas. It's what are you looking forward to at Christmas? <laughs> Celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ is the correct answer. Amen? That wasn't the response that the kids gave, though, was it? <laughs> Getting presents was the more common response. But Peter didn't leave it there. Peter did a wonderful job. Peter asked, what does it feel like when you get a Christmas gift? Well, like excitement and happiness and surprise and joy. Joy was a common response. Then Pastor Peter asked, what does it feel like to give a Christmas gift? Much of the same responses, uh, probably, I don't remember them being as enthusiastic about uh, the responses to what it feels like to give a Christmas gift, but it was always joy. Joy was a part of that response from the children that day in Minden. As I have reflected on that children's sermon, I'm reminded about our response 
to receiving not just a once a year gift at Christmas, but a life gift that continues to be revealed to us each day. What is your response to receiving the good news of Jesus Christ? Joy? What is your response to receiving the gift of grace that has been given to you by God? Joy? What does that response look like when you gather together as United Methodist in your local church? Joy and celebration? What is your witness to the grace and good news of Christ in your local church? Is it a witness of joy, of thanksgiving, and joining together in God's work among and through us as the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Ephesus? Is it a witness of joy, of hope for what God is doing and calling for us to do as disciples of Jesus Christ? Or is our witness and response something else? Maybe it's like that day with the children when they were asked that question of how many days. They shrug of the shoulders. I'm really not sure. Nothing going on here to get excited about. Or is our witness and response something else still? A fear of anger, of division. A witness not of joy, but of something else that diverts us and drains us and exhausts us from celebrating and giving thanks to God for what God is doing through and with us. Celebrate the joy of Jesus that has and is and will be revealed to you as the people of God, as United Methodist in your local communities. Celebrate and give thanks for the opportunities we have for sharing the good news of Jesus, of Christ's offering of grace, of forgiveness, of mercy, of love to others around you. We are called to be a witness of the joy of Jesus in our midst. You know the old Sunday school song, that vacation Bible school music, tune. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And as United Methodist, we have a calling to sing out that joy that's down in our heart, to share. That witness of joy is contagious. It changes us. It charges and empowers and bids us to share, to reach out, and to proclaim the joy of Jesus with all the world around us. What is your witness of joy? Or is the question we're going to ask here in a little bit that was a part of our uh, um, charge conference work uh, with the Wesleyan mission is what is your congregation going to do in the next year to be intentional about helping people love God, neighbor, self, or to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. What is your witness of joy? Let us sing together.
expect him. I want you to get up and mix a bit, uh, maybe find some folks that are not uh, as familiar to you, a stranger perhaps, uh, somebody in a different congregation. I'm going to have a question that comes up on the board that uh, deals with what is our witness of joy? What is it that you are excited about in this next year sharing? What is your congregation going to do in the next year to be intentional about helping people love God, neighbor, self, or to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? So if you'll find a group of five, six, four, and just sit down with them and share a little bit about what is going on in your church, what kind of ministries or missions are you participating in? I invite you to move back to your seats. I know you just got a brief little uh, bit of time of sharing there. I'd, I'm hoping that that time of sharing will continue as we uh, move to the fellowship hall.
were some of the offerings that you heard of ministries that were going on at other churches, were they similar to what you were doing at your church? Maybe you heard something that people are doing a little bit different. I've heard, uh, heard some interesting ones uh, as, uh, as charge conferences have been going on. I invite you when we go to the fellowship hall maybe to share a little bit more about those particular things. I'm now going to move us to our business of the charge conference. So I'm going to ask the recording secretaries. Uh, you all have your uh, clipboards and your pens. Okay, this has to be one of the easiest recording secretary jobs ever. You just have to check some things. And um, it, it's pretty straightforward. So I'll be leading uh, this together. So you want to make sure that on, as a recording secretary, you have listed what your church name is um, on there, if that's not already there, and who the pastor's uh, name is on your recording paper there. Th those are probably the hardest questions you're going to have to deal with. No, the hardest one is counting how many people you have from your church here with you. So you're going to take a little head count in your area to find out how many people are here um, representing your church. And as I move through these particular items, um, for the most part, we'll be voting together. Um, if I call for a yes vote, I would ask that you might affirm and say yes for that vote or have the opportunity, if there's a no, um, that you could vote no. The first item on, um, on, the, on the list of our business items is the approval of the 2023 minutes, last year's minutes. You should have perhaps seen those maybe at your last uh, church council, administrative board, uh, one board meeting that you had. So I'm going to ask whether you would affirm yes for approval. Yes. Or no? Okay. So, recording secretaries, you can write yes. There you go. The Wesleyan mission form um, being affirmed. That is, a, I think that's a, a worksheet that you probably worked through as a church council, administrative board, um, your congregation at some point in this last year. Do you affirm that um, form, that mission work? A yes? yes or no? Okay. Some of you have care of memberships. Um, that is a list of names that you've perhaps had before the charge conference over the last several years. Um, are there names to be removed? If there's a yes from your particular congregational group, um, say yes, yes. or no. no. And um, do we approve of that? A yes? A yes. Or no? And we have our clergy compensation, uh, the base salary and the housing exclusion. It includes the housing resolution and accountable reimbursement um, accounts that you have. If you uh, approve of that, say yes. yes. Or no? Okay, your pastors are all very happy about that. <laughs> don't, li don't like hearing no's on that one. Endowments and budgets. Some of you may have your budget that is a part of your packet that you're sharing as a church. Some of, it, uh, some of you may have a budget that is being done at a later point. Um, we're approving um, the endowment first um, with a yes vote. If you have yeah. an endowment. Yeah. Okay. And a no? Okay. So you want to mark those down or not applicable if you don't have an endowment. If you don't have an endowment, talk to the Nebraska United Methodist Foundation. Then our 2025 budget church paid pastor expenses, um, which are part of that budgeting piece there that we uh, will approve as charge conferences. If that is a yes, say yes. yes. 
or a no, say no. And then there is the nomination report. Um, Pastor Matt uh, Fowler reminded me, as has been my practice during these charge conferences, to uh, um, speak about the nomination report as being a work in progress. We as United Methodist are, are very familiar with the concept of going on to perfection. Um, I, I know that when I was uh, serving as a local pastor, I don't know if I ever had a perfected nomination report at Charge Conference. It always seemed like there are a few openings still yet to, to be filled in. So um, as we approve this, we'll be also approving uh, in the motion to allow your church to continue to work on those openings uh, and to be filled by uh, um, your nomination lay leadership uh, team and uh, your governing body, church council, administrative board, or uh, uh, one church board. If you'd approve of that, uh, that report, say yes, yes. Or, no. or no. If you say no, that means you volunteer for one of those openings, <laughs> right? All right. The next several items probably don't apply to all of your congregations, but do we have anyone that has uh, reports for a certified lay servant or speaker reports by a congregation? Okay, we've got one. Okay. Any others? Okay. If you have those, um, we will ask for an approval, a yes vote. Say yes. yes. Okay. Or no? Okay. Um, do we have any recommended candidates for initial approval? I haven't had any, I think, in the district so far, but uh, I'm looking around the room. Okay. Then that one you just put NA for recording secretaries. And do we have recommended continuing candidates for approval? Um, and I don't think we have any of those either. So we'll be um, asking for approval of that. Uh, or no, or not applicable. So probably the not applicable is uh, the response for you as local church recording secretaries. Other church business, do we have any churches that are planning on implementing a one church model um, board of governance? I think we have one, and one back there, one over there, any others? Okay, so this one, not everybody has to vote, but you as a local con and oh, yep, yep, okay, my wife's waving at me too, so okay. <laughs> Callaway's included. Um, so you'll be voting as I ask for this approval of those uh, one church um, models uh, to be implemented. You'll just be answering for your local church. Um, do you approve of those uh, motions? Uh, say yes. Or no? Okay. And that is our other business. Now comes the other difficult part. You'll want to get your recording secretary signature on that bottom line there. I think on most of them, I have personally, well, Christy has inserted my signature into the paperwork, I think is what's happened here. And uh, that concludes our business uh, portion of our charge conference. I'd ask that we might... Uh, Stand to sing together, we thy people praise thee, and then we will move to the fellowship hall. Um, Christy Baltzel, who's the administrative assistant for me for the district, will be collecting from you, recording secretaries, the signed and checked marked list there as we exit. So let us sing. Not this time.
Go joyfully and share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever you go and serve and share in ministry. Go forth and head on over to the fellowship hall and uh, share some uh, cookies. Matt doesn't want to eat them all. And take them home if, uh, you, if they're not all gone already. And continue to visit and share about the ministries that are going on in your church, different things that you might be doing different this year, or a program that you have been continuing to do. Share that with some of the folks around you.